Okay, hi everybody. This is uh, Dr. Sarah Siddiqui and I'm here for my Facebook Live, but I'm um, pre-recording it. So if you have any questions or comments, you can always comment to the um, Elwood Public Library and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. So um, thank you so much to the Elwood Public Library for um, allowing me to come and present to you guys. Um, this month's topic is what to do, it's very timely actually, what to do if your child has flu, respiratory illness, um, and or COVID. So um, we are starting to see some of these things in our office and um, it's a very good idea to kind of go over it and make sure that you know what to do. So um, of course, I want to also let you know that I don't have any disclosures for this discussion. And of course, as always, please discuss any specific medical advice with your medical provider. Um, this discussion is for informational and um, educational purposes only. So um, please keep in touch with your physician. That's always the message here. And, um, but I'm happy to um, be here and give you some educational or instructional things that sometimes I give to my patients. So, okay, let's get started. So I wanted to just kind of go through and do like a little, like frequently asked questions that I get in the office regarding, of course, COVID-19, um, influenza and other respiratory illnesses that are commonly presenting in children, especially um, this time of year. So this time of year, pre-COVID, I wanna say, this time of year would always be, um, where children are getting a lot of respiratory illnesses, um, asthma, bronchitis, upper respiratory tract illnesses, lower respiratory tract illnesses. So um, it is a very common time in um, pediatricians offices, uh, doctor's offices to have a lot of people that are having um, cough, cold and congestions. And that's because in the winter time is when we see a lot of the um, common cold and flu viruses circulating. So um, in the medical community, when, um, you know, this time of year is always kind of, um, you know, we do get worried about children uh, and uh, when they have a respiratory illness. So um, what can I do? This is a very common question. So how do I prevent a respiratory illness in my child? Um, let me see if I can move this up a little bit. Yeah. So what can I do to prevent a respiratory illness um, in my child? Well, uh, coming into the winter season, if you can, uh, try to um, try try to maintain a healthy active lifestyle so this goes for everyone try to do um, have a healthy uh, diet filled with uh, fresh fruits vegetables um, plenty of water um, drink get your calcium in yogurt cheese milk um, have your healthy fats and lean protein and try to have a really um, good diet for the most part and you know some days are better than others for all of us uh, but it's really important to make sure that your diet is um, um, as healthy as possible. And that keeps your immune system healthy. So our immune system is a big component here. Uh, the healthier our immune system is, the healthier our body is, and the healthier we can fight off um, disease. Sleep is really, really important. So we wanna always get our proper rest. You wanna make sure that you're resting, um, if you can, for eight to 10 hours a night. I mean, it varies by age. And there are some people that need less. There are some people that need more. Uh, so you have to kind of know your body and make sure that you're getting the proper rest that you need. And that, again, helps our immune system. Activity, so maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been suggesting that we try to maintain 30 minutes of activ activity a day with uh, some increase in your heart rate. Of course, you want to speak to your medical provider and make sure that you speak with them before, discuss with, before starting any new exercise plan. Um, but it is really important to do something where you're increasing your heart rate for 30 minutes, uh, 20 to 30 minutes a day. If you can, then you can even do cumulative where you can do it five minutes and take a break, five minutes and take another break so that it all adds up to the 30 minutes total. So that's another way to do it if you're building up to the 30 minutes for you and your children. And it's really important, all these things you can do as a family. 
uh, everybody can kind of do it together. Frequent hand hygiene. This is so, so important. So one of the main ways that our children get sick in uh, schools or in daycares or even at home is by touching uh, their, their face or touching their eyes or touching their nose or uh, touching their mouth. Um, and that's how bacteria and viruses get into our system. One of the main ways, there are several different ways, but that's one of the main ways. So if we keep our hands clean and frequent hand washing, that really does help improve uh, any or decrease the uh, amount of germs that can enter our body. And of course, during now, during um, COVID-19, we do recommend staying home when you're not feeling well. Uh, this also helps to reduce uh, respiratory illness in children because if there are less other, if there are other children that are not sick in the school environment or daycare environment, that's decreased chance of everyone else getting sick. Um, and prior to COVID, one of the main reasons why we would see frequent illnesses, uh, respiratory illnesses in the wintertime season, one of the reasons is because uh, that, that's when most children get sick from October to March. And you can have up to six to eight colds or respiratory infections in a year, and that will be from October to March, and each one lasts two weeks. So um, we are seeing a little bit less than that now, although in the younger children, we are seeing some um, more congestion and coughs recently. But uh, if, if you're staying home when you're not feeling well, or you're keeping your child home when they're not feeling well, that would also decrease the chances of other children catching um, some of the colds and congestion that would go around. And another way to prevent respiratory illnesses is if you have um, any history of asthma or allergies to keep up to date on your medications, make sure that you are taking them if you need them, if you need uh, inhalers uh, or things like that to prevent um, asthma or, or to um, help your respiratory system be as healthy as possible, then continue those medications and talk to your doctor about that. Let's see how I go to the next slide. Oop, not that way. Uh oh. Let's see. Next slide. Like that? No. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm... Okay, so yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so why is my child still getting sick? So I, I do get this question a lot, um, especially now we're, you know, not um, seeing everybody as often. We're not, uh, everybody's staying home when they're not feeling well, but still we're seeing children in the office with some congestion, coughs, and colds. And especially because we're not even going to the grocery store that much or um, with our children. So how are our children getting sick or how are they still getting coughs and colds? Well, uh, like I said previously, children um, under age five um, or even older, it depends on what their exposures are, get common colds very frequently. So in the winter months, and that's defined as from October to March usually, uh, coughs and congestion can occur six to eight times and with each cold lasting two weeks. So, uh, children can be having a runny nose or congestion for the entire time. Uh, if each cold lasts two weeks and then they kind of have just a couple of days of, of uh, downtime or normal time, it, it can mean that they uh, seem to be having chronic congestion uh, for months. So for at least three to four months. And um, this is very common and, and very normal part of um, childhood colds and coughs. So, but because they're constantly building immunity. So until they have the full immunity to some of these common 
illnesses that go around, they, uh, their first years spent in daycare or school um, in kindergarten or, or in the early daycare years, they will be having a runny nose. Now they're not, they're, it, it's not something that uh, is so severe uh, that they're not feeling well or they're persistently um, not appearing well. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when they kind of have a congestion or runny nose and they're, they're otherwise fine. They're playful, they're eating okay, they don't have a fever. So those are kind of more of the milder coughs and colds and we're still seeing a little bit of those. Uh, the, uh, and the, the reason why they still get those the younger children is because they're still touching surfaces um, under two or under even three. They don't need to be wearing masks right now in daycare settings. So they're still touching their eyes and their nose and their mouth. And that's a very common way for virus and bacteria to enter into the system. Another way that the um, viruses and bacteria that enter into our system is through our skin. And a lot of times when we have dry skin or even a history of eczema, there's certain things that sometimes that's a, a way that certain bacteria can enter our system because we do have normal bacteria that live on our skin and that can get into um, some of the not intact areas of our, of our skin. So it's really important to also moisturize, make sure that our dry skin doesn't stay dry because that's an area of um, entrance to our body. So even now with masking and distancing in place, children are still having symptoms of the common cold as well as other illnesses. So um, it is really important to get keep in touch with your doctor because some of these mild illnesses that I'm talking about that you know really they just look fine and they just have a little bit of a cough or runny nose can still be something like COVID related because sometimes it can present like that. So we need to perform testing um, to differentiate between some of the common colds and, and COVID. So let's see if I can switch the slide now. There we go. Okay, what are some of the common causes of um, coughs in children? Well, there's quite a few, but most common. Um, asthma is one of the uh, most common causes of cough, but it doesn't, it's not really diagnosed the first time that your child has a cough. It has to be, uh, it's a diagnosis of kind of um, exclusion and, and, re and repetition actually. So asthma is a reversible uh, cough that occurs with many different triggers. So you can have a cold induced asthma, you can have allergy induced asthma, you can have a congestion induced asthma. So there's many different things that cause um, asthma, which is, a, which is a cough or wheezing. So it can be just a cough variant asthma, it's called. So you wanna discuss these things with your doctor, uh, but that is a very common cause of like a chronic type of cough. Then there are medications that we give for that. Bronchiolitis is actually a viral uh, illness that is, um, causes congestion and um, bronchospasm, which is, a, which is a constriction in our lungs, in younger kids. So this usually presents in children under one, and it's caused by a virus called RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus. And it's more common in preterm or uh, babies born before 35 weeks or 36 weeks. It can happen after that too, but um, it's, it's more somewhat of, a, of an issue in, in preterm babies that can, it can be very dangerous and require hospitalization sometimes. So, but it is very common also to have bronchiolitis in the under one uh, age group because their lungs are still not, um, their lung tubes uh, sometimes get congested uh, or, or have inflammation build up and can cause some wheezing, but not necessarily asthma. So bronchiolitis is, a, is, a, is, a, is the term used to um, explain why some babies under one may have uh, cough or wheezing. And the treatments um, for that are sometimes we give um, a nebulizer or maybe um, steam shower, um, or, or uh, sometimes we use albuterol, but most of the time we use saline with a nebulizer. Uh, viral bronchitis is also similar to an asthmatic type picture where you have a constriction of the lung tubes and that causes um, the cough in children. 
group is a is a definite um, uh, is a is a is caused by a virus. It's called it's caused by a, a para influenza virus. So you might notice the term influenza in there, but it's actually not a flu virus. It's called a para influenza virus, and it's a virus that can cause um, inflammation in the upper airway. So croup is the inflammation in your upper trachea. Inflammation means that there's kind of like a narrowing of that tube, and that's why you have that high-pitched barking cough and usually we see that in babies from six months to children age six or even up even higher and we um, usually can pretty much um, listen to the cough and tell you that that's croup so if you kind of go even online or google croupy cough it sounds like a high-pitched barky cough and it usually occurs at night this is one of those times where um, you know, we, we as pediatricians know that sometimes the 2 a.m. calls, uh, it, it does, it, it is quite a scary cough that's, that if you've never heard before, it does sound like the child can be having difficulty breathing and it is quite um, scary. So uh, we do get those phone calls at night. And um, one of the things that we tell you um, is to go outside with your child because outside cool air helps to calm it down a little bit and some steam helps to calm it down also. Um, allergies uh, or allergic rhinitis, so post-nasal drip. And usually when you have allergies, you have an increased mucus production. Um, your body's trying to clear out something or, or, um, or get rid of something by producing histamine and sometimes that can cause an increase in um, post nasal drip and mucus production and that gets stuck in the back of your throat and then you want to cough so that's another common uh, reason and i just like this picture of the <laughs> of the inhaler there so that's why i put that okay so what are some symptoms of upper respiratory illness um, upper respiratory illness is also known as URI, and that's a very common um, delineation of, of a lot of the colds and congestion that we see in the office. So those, those symptoms include cough, congestion, uh, sometimes we can see fever, chills, sweats, decreased appetite, you can have a runny nose or a stuffy nose, and you can have headache, sinus congestion, or sore throat present with that. Um, so you do wanna get in touch with your doctor uh, for any of those symptoms, or if, the if your child has uh, really decreased fluid intake, which is always a red flag, we wanna know about that, uh, because fluids is really important. We wanna make sure that your child's not getting dehydrated secondary to not being able to swallow as well because of their symptoms. Um, and one of the main ways that we can tell that they might be getting dehydrated if they, is if they have decreased urination. Uh, so if their urine is um, very concentrated or dark, uh, that tells us that they're not getting enough fluids. If they have a persistent cough, so they're constantly coughing, this is very, very abnormal. Uh, you wanna get in touch with your doctor for that. Or if there's any difficulty breathing or rapid breathing. So rapid breathing or shallow breathing is something that we uh, do not want you to wait till the morning. We wanna know about that right away. And these are just pictures of people with masks. And the masks honestly do seem to be decreasing some of the respiratory illnesses that we're seeing. So who knows, maybe masks maybe here to stay for a little bit longer. I don't know, I can't say anything about that, but I do think that in the office, we're not seeing as much of upper respiratory illnesses as we usually do this time of year at the pediatrician's office, so. Um, all right, let's see. Okay, and what are some symptoms of lower respiratory illness? So lower respiratory, respiratory illness usually signifies more of a pneumonia or bronchitis. So a pneumonia is basically an infection in one part of your lung. Uh, it can be caused by bacteria or virus. And sometimes you can have a viral illness like, the, like influenza or even COVID where a virus affects one of the areas of the lung and then can cause a bacterial pneumonia on top or a bacterial infection on top of that area of the lung. So um, this is a picture of your lungs. So you start with the big branches. If anybody ever came to one of my vaping talks, I love talking about the lungs in one of those talks. But anyway, we won't go into vaping today, don't worry. Um, but if you kind of look at the bigger um the 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 bigger uh let me see if i can make the yeah okay so the bigger lung tube here this is um 
uh, your trachea and then it splits up into two, two bronchii. Um, and then you have the left and the, and the right main stem bronchus. And then that divides up into smaller and smaller little areas. And so when you have a pneumonia, one area of the lung, let's say if it's a left lower lobe pneumonia, is the part where it gets um, infected. So that's where bacteria or virus can um, accumulate. And then there's limited aeration in that, in that area. And that could be um, harmful if lasts for a long time because there's no air exchange taking place in that area. So children with history of asthma are more at risk for developing lower respiratory tract infections because they sometimes do have inflammation or congestion. Um, and so the bacteria or virus can't like can't um, come out or can't kind of move through the, the lungs. So um, it can cause problems and it's much easier for virus and, and bacteria to kind of stay there. We do have like little hair in our uh, respiratory tract called cilia. And that really helps to avoid uh, mucus or, or I'm sorry, bacteria and virus from, from sitting there for long periods of time. So the cilia really helps to make sure everything's moving. And that's why you have mucus too. Mucus also is actually helpful. And that's whenever anybody says to increase your fluids, whenever you're congested is because the mucus then thins out and that thins out in the respiratory tract, it thins out in the nose, it thins out in the back of your mouth. And that's how things kind of stay moving. Um, and you want to continue to stay up to date with preventative medications like your steroid inhalers and rescue inhalers that we always um, advise for kids and adults with asthma. And of course, keep in touch with your doctor. That's probably the theme of the whole talk. Okay, so how is influenza or flu different from COVID-19? So I thought we would include, um, even though the original talk, I think when we discussed, when I discussed with the Elwood Public Library, I'm not, you know, at that time, I didn't know whether we'd be talking about COVID-19 or not, but I thought I would put it in here because we are um, kind of dealing with that a little bit. So there are, the next few slides are gonna go over some commonalities with flu and COVID-19, and then also some other questions that I get about COVID in children. So um, yeah, so there are very, um, a lot of commonalities. Um, both are respiratory illnesses, they're transmitted by respiratory droplets, and um, you can have high fever, although mostly when you see high fever, it could be more influenza, but body aches and pains. And um, you usually have to test. So even for influenza, we do have testing uh, that you can test for flu A and flu B. Um, and that helps us, that guides us as to when the flu actually hits our area. So um, I almost don't like saying this too much, but we really, um, uh, the, the, the flu um, is, is not as prevalent right now, which is not going to be very uh, thankful for that, but you know we we are always anticipating, and anything can change, uh, and that's why testing is so so important because sometimes you can't really tell just by looking or or kind of just by asking what the symptoms are, what exactly is causing it. So influenza is caused by um, a, 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 a constellation of different influenza viruses. So there's many, many strains and they different ones circulate. And that's why there's different flu vaccines that we give every year because we do try to guess or make an educated guess about the best ones that are gonna be you know, kind of causing the that year's flu, and that's the ones that are that's the ones that are put in the flu vaccine every year. So there's four strains that are placed to A strains and two B strains. And that's how uh, we try to protect the population against the flu. And the thinking is that even though it's not an exact match, it still helps to reduce transmission and reduce severity of the flu. Um, so because these viruses have a lot of similarities in it. And that's how the flu vaccine works. And um, that's one of the only ways that you can prevent the flu. And also by keeping your immune system nice and healthy and active. And in influenza though, illness can be much, much more severe in children. And I try to tell, uh, reinforce this to my patients all the time that um, influenza does cause uh, fatality and severity in children, whereas um, it's not the case for COVID-19 in children anyway. So it is really important to maintain um, vaccination against flu for especially young children, because that is one of the only ways that we can protect them from the flu. Uh, last year in 2019, the 2018-19 flu season, 
I'm sorry, and even the 2019-2020 uh, flu season, 80% uh, of children that were hospitalized with the flu were unvaccinated. So uh, it did reduce some of the severity. So um, it is important to get your flu vaccine. So COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It spreads much, much more easily than the flu. Um, and it causes serious, serious illness in some people. And it does take longer before people show symptoms. So with influenza, um, usually the incubation is two to three days, whereas COVID-19, as we all know now, um, it can be up to 10 days or even seven to 10 days. And people are contagious for a little longer with COVID-19 also. So that's why it's a little bit, it's been harder to contain COVID-19 because you can be asymptomatic for a longer period of time and it takes longer for you to show symptoms. So we don't know that we have symptoms until we present and then we have to kind of look back. Um, and the prevention for COVID-19, as we all know, uh, isolation, masking, hand hygiene, and um, avoiding you know, lots of people, lots of crowds. Okay, let's see, did I do that right? Okay, so um, this is a very, very common question nowadays. My child was exposed to someone that tested positive or someone that may have been sick. So what should I do? What's my next step? So um, what I usually say is, of course, discuss with your doctor. So when I get this question, I always ask, like, what were the specific circumstances surrounding the exposure? Was it in a school? Was it in, um, what is that, a home? Was it um, a, a short-term exposure? Was it a long-term exposure? So according to the CDC guidelines, and I know that everybody's probably aware of this already, but um, according to the CDC, exposure is if you've been um, within close contact, so six feet, and um, with or without a mask, but within six feet and for longer than 10 minutes counts as a primary exposure. Of course, in your home, it's uh, very easy to get a prolonged exposure and that's why in-home transmission seems to be um, much, uh, in-home transmission seems to be much, uh, seems to be um, responsible for a lot of the spread. Um, because that is a much closer contact. So really the best way or the best thing to do is testing. Um, and you have to, and like the previous slides, because flu and, and SARS-CoV-2 virus are very similar, really, and other respiratory viruses too, it's really just testing. It comes down to testing. Um, and that we do have to test, unfortunately. Even the children that, have, that seem to have just mild illness or just the plain simple cough congestion, they look like they just have a sore throat or runny nose. Uh, testing is the only way to really be, um, uh, be aware that you know it, it, that there might be some um, a different virus, and and then that way you can take precaution. And many other respiratory illnesses can present with very similar symptoms. So if your child does not show any symptoms, um, or and if they've been exposed, you can just watch them. You can quarantine at home for the ten days and make sure that you um, you know don't send them to school just in case. And if the ten days go by and they have not had any symptoms, they can return. So there's not a rec there's not a, a stern recommendation that they need to get tested before they come back. Um, if symptoms develop, it's always testing is the best option. So there's a PCR, which is the polymerase chain reaction, and that's a test, uh, that, that's, that's the gold standard test. And then there's also a rapid antigen test um, that gives results in 15 minutes, but it might not be as accurate as the polymerase chain reaction test. So the rapid antigen test tests for protein, um, which is really um, sometimes difficult to detect. And then the PCR detects DNA material, which, is, which can be very, very sensitive, which means that it, it can pick it up even for small amounts. So what are the most common symptoms of COVID-19? And again, this is really um, important. Um, fever, fatigue, headaches, um, body aches, cough, nasal congestion. So these are all very common symptoms of any cold or cough virus, right? But new loss of taste or smell is definitely something very specific for COVID. So that's something that when I hear, we know that it could most likely be COVID. Uh, but the rest of them, sore throat, um, shortness of breath. Recently, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting have been the um, way that children have been presenting. The younger kids have been presenting with some um, GI type symptoms. So that's really important. 
And um, you can even have a strep throat or like a sore throat similar to strep. And then allergies. Sometimes kids come in and they just have like, it just looks like that's their allergies. They have a little runny nose. They even have sinus congestion and they can even wind up to be having COVID. So that's why testing is just so important. Um, and lack of specific symptoms, it makes it just more difficult to differentiate. And the CDC website reports that up to 50% of children may be asymptomatic. So, um, so uh, that's part of it. That's part of the issue. Um, so my child tested positive for COVID-19, now what shall I do? So if um, there are symptoms present, and most of the time, thankfully, thankfully, the children are doing well, uh, even when they've tested positive or if they're symptomatic. So they usually um, get through it pretty quickly. They recover. It's really important to do fluids, rest, uh, fever reducing agents, pain relievers. Of course, keep in touch with your doctor for any symptoms because there are sometimes certain times where things can get worse. So of course, we're gonna seek emergent care if there's any shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, decreased intake of fluids, dehydration, or persistent vomiting. And children usually recover pretty quickly, but they need supportive care. So um, in isolation, we really don't recommend um, for small children, we don't recommend that they stay in a separate room. Uh, obviously, they need to be taken care of, they need to be taken care for, and they should not be left alone when they're sick. And they don't seem to be the ones spreading the disease, uh, but it's, of course, it's important to be uh, vigilant. So um, as an adult, if the, one of the parents tests positive for COVID-19, so now what should I do with my child? Is my child okay? Are they gonna be okay? What should I do? So if an adult in the home has tested positive for COVID-19 and is symptomatic, you do wanna avoid contact with the rest of the family. So you wanna start wearing a mask, you wanna isolate in a separate living space. You may want to even use a different bathroom if that's, if that's possible in your area. And um, some of the things that I've been telling parents to do, you know, take their vitamins, start vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc. Um, there's something called an incentive spirometer. So I don't know if you've ever had surgery, you'll see you get those things that you kind of take deep breaths in. It has like a little ball, you take a deep breath. That really makes sure that you're taking good, big, deep breaths. And that's what you want to do uh, if you've been testing, if you've tested positive for COVID. You want to start taking really deep breaths, keep those lungs inflated. You want to consider sleeping on your stomach because that also makes sure that the separate parts of your lungs stay inflated. Keep in touch with your doctor. And there are lots of treatments available now to prevent severe disease. So there's something called um, a monoclonal antibodies, which needs to be through an IV infusion and you need to be in touch with your doctor and you have to have not severe disease. It's kind of mild to moderate disease that they can treat you with, but it does require you to go into an ER setting for an um, infusion. So that is something that I try to tell the parents of my patients. And when should I call the doctor? Well, anytime, you know, anytime you can call your doctor. Nobody's ever gonna say, oh, why are you calling me? We never, ever, ever say that, especially in pediatric. Um, but if your child or you has difficulty breathing, rapid or shallow breathing, decreased or no urination, very sleepy or lethargic, and on the other end of that, irritable or cranky, not going down, not sleeping, persistent cough, vomiting, and any symptom that's making you worry, you call or you go or you get yourself taken care of, please, please. All right, and the vaccine, I didn't know whether I was gonna put this slide on there, but um, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine has, has come out um, as of today, it's now 1A and 1B in New York State. So basically all um, healthcare workers, um, people that work with children in schools, um, adults over the age of 75 and high risk um, adults can get it. So, you know, um, children, unfortunately, they weren't really part of the studies when the initial vaccine came out. They can, children over 16 can be vaccinated currently, um, but you have to be in one of the 1A or 1B categories as of now. The vaccine trials have initiated in children over 12, um, but no, from what I understand, no vaccine plan is currently in place for children under 12. And this may be because under 12 seem to not suffer from severe disease or seem to spread disease, but um, you know, they're still in talks. I know the American Academy of Pediatrics has been pushing to try to have children participate in some of the vaccine trials, uh, but we're not there at this time. So that's what I know about the kids, but a lot of parents have been asking me about that. 
And please send comments or questions to the Elwood Public Library. Again, I thank you so much for allowing me to do this um, every, every month. Tell me if you're getting bored of it, but I enjoy it. So um, I'm happy to do it. And please let me know if there's any questions or comments that you have, and I'll try to get back to you. Because again, this is previously recorded. Um, so I guess it's not a Facebook Live this time, but I try to do it live. And um, these are my sources. I, I love the cdc.gov website. They have a lot of great material. And then the healthychildren.org is one of my go-tos for my patients. And thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great day. And let's see if I can stop the video. Bye. Okay, so how do I stop sharing?